Try it now. Wow, shoot. I don't know why this would be happening. It wasn't happening. What what changed? <laughs> Scott. Um, I don't know. Oh. It happens sometimes with headphones. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the podcast. Is it me? Oh, I just saw your text, Scott. Sorry that I missed you for a while. No, it's okay. Um, yeah, that's better. Or is it still echoing? A okay. little bit. I don't know why that would be. Some, uh, it's really weird. Um, oh, you might have two windows open, Nate. Do you have two yeah, windows yeah. open? Maybe. Let's see. I'm going to turn everything else off. Ah, yes. That's the problem. That was the problem. We're getting right. so much better. It's only taken us 568 episodes and we're live. Yeah. No, no, we're, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be, we are going to be up when Omicron really crashes. Yeah, it will, it'll be, well, it'll be like the second pandemic will be like our gold, or like our sweet spot. <laughs> I, the, the, the conversation on that show is, is for shit, but they're, they got their tech down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It is Thursday, December 16th. 5.05 p.m. I had a late intro uh, because we had a little bit of tech glitches and I wanted to get us started on time in Ben's absence because we know that I'm not great at that. Um, but we're not allowed to have fun anymore. We're really not allowed to have fun because I know 10 people in New York City that have tested positive today, uh, including, I think I texted you, Scott. I, I don't know if I told Nate this, but I had like a, a fellow law professor, that friend, uh, who's been on the show uh, that like invited us, John and I over to his house for dinner and we were gonna go over on Monday night. And he was like, oh, like I went to a thing on Saturday and this person tested positive. And so, but I tested negative, like just a couple of hours ago. So I tested negative and I think I'm fine. It, like, but out of an abundance of caution, maybe you guys don't wanna come over. And I was like, meh, like we'll just reschedule. And then he called me yesterday and was like, oh, I am really sick. And he had tested positive and everyone at the party had tested positive. Like everyone, every, like it was a super spread. And they were triple, they were all boosted. Really? And he said it, the person who was boosted said he was really sick too? Well, he like said it was like a flu the first day and then a bad cold. Oh, okay. But he was like okay. sick. Like, I mean, like not like go to the hospital sick. I should be very clear, right? There's okay. like, but anyways, we're not allowed to have fun anymore really increasingly looks like we're not allowed to have Christmas anymore. <laughs> I mean, like if the last two years is any indication, glad we got in Hanukkah early. Um, <laughs> snuck it in under the, the lunar wire. Um, we are allowed this, this, have... is the, this is the way conspiracy theories start, you know, so. Uh... <laughs> oh God, <gasps> don't say that Nate. <laughs> I'm just learning all about the crazy conspiracy theory. Like Ben is teaching me about what is it? Can, what is it? The capitalist globalists or co cosmopolitan globalists? Sure. I didn't know. But, I didn't know that theory. Yeah. Do, do, do you want? Do you want to see my uh, my business card that has that on it? That's that's my. Uh... <laughs> Does it really? That's amazing. We we had a woman on the show on Friday that was like has a newsletter called the Cosmopolitan Globalist, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting like newsletter. And like Ben is like, she might as well say. Jewy McJew. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what? And I'd literally never heard this before. Um, so this is like episode 15 of Ben teaches Kate like the, like the <laughs> what it means to be Jewish in the world. <laughs> I know. Um, but anyways, uh, we are not okay. I said this already, but we have Nate personally on the show today. I've been really excited to talk to you for a while. I tried to have you on last week, but we got uh, overbooked weirdly. And, um, but I'm super glad we can have you on today to talk about, uh, the bill that you wrote, which I think you had talked about really briefly on the show before, but now it is an actual bill bill that has been introduced by Coons, Portland and Klobuchar and in the Senate. And, um, I, I want to start out by like in this, in this schoolhouse rock scenario, Nate, are you like the bill? Are you the kid sitting on the steps next to the bill? Are you like 
Are you like some like homeless person shuffling by? I just put into the chat here the the text of the bill so people can see it. And and my the early version of the bill. I was gonna I, put uh, your yeah. I was gonna put your early version of the bill up if that's okay. Well, for the coons. Well, I want to. I'll talk about the the current version since that's the one that would be more likely to pass. The my, the earlier version. If you go to my Twitter feed at personally, it's in the with my testimony at, um, at the top of the page. So let me just tell the uh, genealogy of this a little bit. So I had, as, as you know, I've been working for many years trying to get data out of Facebook through an, a, a group called Social Science One that Gary King at Harvard and I studied. We've been banging ourselves against the, our heads against the wall for, for quite a while in trying to get the individual level data um, out there. And, and in the hands of the uh, social scientific community. We made some progress and y'all can you know, see more about that or I can answer questions on that. Um, um, but, but I became convinced that because of the obstacles that the general counsels inside Facebook and the privacy people were erecting to our effort that only federal legislation would be able, would, could facilitate outsider access to platform data. I then started working about a year ago on legislation that would do that with a law firm. Uh, May I just say, I, may, may, uh, uh, Nate, just one quick question. Uh, um, do you think that the objections that general counsel at Facebook and the privacy people, do you think that those were like bona fide objections or do you think they were just trying to hold you at bay? So I think the objections were, were genuinely held. These were not pretextual. Um, but I disagree with their legal interpretations, both okay. of GDPR, the European privacy law, and the FTC consent decree. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, in fact, I held a, a meeting in Brussels with people from Facebook and data protection authorities to try to say, all right, this is okay, right? And I'll, and I'll say that the data protection authorities did not exactly acquit themselves well, um, because they said things like this, you, Facebook, will have a good argument under GDPR that this kind of data uh, access is, is okay. And it's like, you know, from the Facebook side, it's like, look, we don't want to know what a good argument is. We want any of it. And remember, this is, this is just in the wake of them paying a $5 billion fine to the FTC in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So um, it's all well and good for me to say, look, these lawyers are being too lawyerly, um, but I'm not the one who had to pay a $5 billion fine. So... So, you know, as anyone who's dealt with Facebook knows, it is a they, not an it, right? So there are teams that are 100%, you know, behind us um, uh, in, on the data access side who, who themselves are academic. Uh, and then there are, are people whose jobs are to protect the company from liability. And so they're, when they hear academics getting access to data, they think Cambridge Analytica. And so they were very restrictive. Uh, and so the, the, the problem is when, when it comes to data access and transparency in general, you have the privacy folks on the one side who are saying no, 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 and they're pointing both to the, um, the, the history of Cambridge Analytica, the FTC fines, but then also people saying, look, what do we get out of this? All the academics are going to do is trash us anyway. So, you know, what, you know, it's a net negative. And then on the other side, it's me saying, well, it's in the public interest, you know, we need to understand these problems. And then I also say to them, look, the truth can't possibly be as bad as what everybody thinks about you. Right. I mean, this is the pitch that I've made to all the Silicon Valley companies, which is that, you know, we if you have academic access, we'll be able to tell a complicated story, unlike the one that is sort of reflexively appearing in print. And so uh, so so then that led me to try to work on a legislative solution here. And um, I was you know, taking it back and forth, sending it to a lot of different people to get comments. Then when Francis Haugen was called to testify uh, in the Senate, I, I figured, all right, you know, now's the time to release this. I mean, because I could have gone back and forth for another 100 drafts. Um, but the day that you testified, I then said, look, if Congress is serious about doing something here, here's something that they can do. And I, you know, I've now come to appreciate the, uh, the appetite that people have for something concrete that looks like a law, as opposed to, say, a white paper, yet another white paper, a report or something. Right. So if you actually have something that is in a format of legislation, then the staff can then pick it up and, you know, cut and paste and plug things in. 
Um, Can we so, actually talk about that for a sec? Well, we finish what you're going to say, but I yeah. really want to dig into that because no, well, I'm actually, really I, curious. I, I, let's dig into that now. I mean, that that I think is that that turned out. I mean, and this is, I think, a um, lesson for tech regulator types in general. You know, people who want to propose something. It's all well. I mean. It, the, the, the line that I've used, it's, it's not only that the details matter, the details are the only thing that matters, right? It's yes. all well good to talk about, you know, CDA 230 should be repealed or this and that, or, or, or how we're going to protect children on Instagram. It's like, sit down and try to deal with the trade-offs. And so for me, the biggest trade-off to deal with were the privacy considerations, right? How do you create a, um, a, a protocol for research or access to firm data, much of which is, you know, sensitive, uh, and do it in a way that you will not have privacy leakage. And so, for example, there are other models that we can, well, just so the audience knows, the, 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 the proposal that I made, which is incorporated into the Coons, Portman, Klobuchar Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, is that the FTC, working with the National Science Foundation, will uh, basically compel the platforms to turn over data to outside researchers, but the data will reside at the firm in a controlled environment and nothing will escape from that environment unless it is done. there's a privacy review that would be conducted. Right? Yeah, so it's that's basically a FISC. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And it's not, it's not dissimilar to what we experienced, say, with census data, that you can, you have these sort of sworn researcher uh, with, with sensitive census data, like the individual level stuff, not the stuff you can get on the web. And, um, and there are other models with healthcare data sets and, uh, you know, where you just have some vetting of the researchers, you have actually in surveillance of the researchers as they uh, conduct their analysis, um, uh, and then looking at their data, you know, looking at whatever leaves that room to make sure there's no leakage of privacy. And, and so, but once they, if they abide by that system, then they will be completely immune from any suits related to violations of privacy as a result, right? That's the idea um, uh, behind, you know, granting this particular procedure. And so there, there are three portions to the, to the Coons, Portman, Klobuchar bill. That's the first one. The second, which is something I also was pushing, is immunity for researchers who engage in scraping um, of publicly available data. So you've had Laura Adelson, I think, on your show before, didn't you? Right? So. Mm -hmm. The audience might be familiar with what happened with NYU, where there yep. was a group of um, researchers who were kicked off of Facebook because they had propagated a plugin to kind of, uh, well, to scrape people's experiences on Facebook that would then reveal something about ads. And, um, and so this would immunize folks like that from criminal prosecution under the CF, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as well as uh, civil claims so they won't be bankrupted. And then the third part of this is something that that Brandon Silverman, who ran CrowdTangle, all helped. I sort of worked with, brought him into this conversation. CrowdTangle was the API that um, that well, it was a company that Facebook bought that allows newsrooms, in particular, but academics use it as well to see which stories are getting, which URLs are getting the most engagement. And so there's a series of provisions in this bill that would require public disclosure of non-private data, right? So that Google and Facebook, when it comes to take, when it comes to content moderation, when it comes to algorithms and advertising, this bill also requires them not only to provide the kind of clean room access, but to uh, scrub the data so to make it available publicly. So just to like kind of really quickly say, like I think that actually, so for instance, the crowd tangle, I think one of the best uses of the crowd tangle data was Kevin Roos's list of the most kind of the most like the most viral stories or the most viral kind of things or accounts like that were happening on Facebook, which in complete con like countermanding the conservative line that basically they were being over censored and that these like these things were being taken down all over where like the most clicked on links were like far and away from conservative news sources um and the most kind of the most distributed uh the most distributed content and so like to your point though nate your greater point where you start about the genealogy of this whole project which is like to the platform's behest is like this level of transparency because it will allow for more kind of but then like 
crowd tangle stopped cooperating i don't know actually how that all ended up like the details of that like ended up kind of like falling out but that kind of fell away and the everything with laura edelson fell away and so kind of like here we are i don't actually know where things stand with laura or um anyone else at this point but um well, let, I, let me give a little news on, on some of that so first yeah. of all the kevin roos thing this is important for people to understand so so what crowd tangle measures is interactions right? Forwarding likes, things like that. And so at the, the, so crowd tangle would show you how much of those public posts were being forwarded and engaged with, right? It didn't actually have exposure data. And that's, that's one of the criticisms that's, that Facebook was making of Kevin Roos and, and others, which is that, yes, it's true that conservatives like Dan Bongino and Ben Shapiro get huge engagement but then they would say, well, no, it's actually not the case that these are the most viral in the sense of the most people are seeing this. That then led Facebook to release quarterly, well, yes. they buried one report, but then they eventually eventually got leaked on exposure data, like the top 10 links that have been you know, seen on Facebook. And that turns out to be not not as sort of uniformly conservative, but it, it has some other flaws, which is it's a lot of like crap, right? It's like really like low quality information, stuff like spammy content that gets through the system. Uh, Casey Newton did a really good uh, piece on that in his sub stack yeah. for those who are interested. And, um, but it didn't, it didn't suggest that, you know, the platform was being manipulated by conservative speakers or, or anything. Um, um, but the, the point was that Facebook was criticizing its own product, saying Crowd Tangle misrepresents what's happening on Facebook. And here we, Facebook, are going to show you like the top 10 or 20 curated links that we've seen. But outside researchers don't have access to that. And that is kind of the motherload question, right? So when people ask me, well, what data do you really need from, from the firms that you don't have on the outside? And the answer is who saw what, when, and why, right? What types of people saw or engaged with what kinds of content? When did that happen? And why did they engage with it, meaning or, or see it, which is, was it a result of the algorithm? Was it a result of searches that they did and the like? If we, and all that level of granularity, to answer those questions, you, all, you can only do it by having access to the firm data, right? You can't really do this from the outside. You can't do it with surveys. And you need large, large samples because you know, whatever problem we think we attribute to face to platforms or the internet, whether it's hate speech or disinformation or incitement and the like, for the most part, you know, what we as on the outside have sort of surmised is that this is a big problem for a small number of people, right? So that the average user does not have an experience on Facebook where it's filled with disinformation and hate speech, but there are a significant minority who do. Um, a lot of this is because they opt into those communities. And so people go into QAnon discussion groups and that kind of thing. Um, but, but really figuring out why it is that certain types of links are more popular than others is a really critical question. Uh, if you're now going to design interventions, whether in the U.S. or elsewhere, to get at, you know, the problem, whatever that problem is. Are, are, there, are there other... Um... <clears throat> Are, are there other industries that have federal requirements to divulge information to help security uh, to, to help researchers? Not really. Uh, and it's interesting that you asked that. I just submitted yeah. and I can I can actually give to the group here. But I just turned in my supplemental Senate testimony on precisely that question uh, and did did a, a hearing this morning for the National Academy of Sciences where they have a panel just on that. And so I'll uh, when I have a moment, I'll, I'll put the links into the chat. Um, but there are so there's no federal aside from federal mandates that, like, say, financial institutions do certain types of disclosure to the government or um, sometimes with pharmaceutical companies or healthcare providers. Right. There are instances where as part of the larger regulatory scheme, you have all this forced disclosure campaign finance being another example. Um, but uh, there are there are voluntary efforts that have been undertaken with greater success. Ma MasterCard does some stuff like this. So there's a, a group called the Health Cost um, uh, something HCCI <laughs> Health Cost Expenditures Institute or something like that. I can't remember. What the, um, oh, Healthcare Cost Institute. Sorry, HCCI. 
that works with private healthcare providers to provide this uh, for researchers. So there are there are models. And, and then the census data that I mentioned before is really the kind of model for, for analyzing federal statistical uh, data. But no, I don't know. The, what we're proposing here is quite different, right? It is, um, and, and you know, if you're on the Facebook side, uh, you're kind of being put into a little bit of receivership here, right? That basically you have now lost the right to be secret, right? And, and for those, and I've had people raise First Amendment questions about this as to whether, you know, we could do something like this. And my view is that, look, if you think, it, it, because people say you couldn't force the New York Times or the Washington Post to embed researchers there to kind of monitor everything that's going on, how can you do that with Facebook and Google? And my answer is, well, because they're not the Washington Post or New York Times, right? That they, they, have, they have achieved a level of scale and monopoly status but that's not even the most compelling reason that they're not the New York Times or like the Washington Post. Like the most compelling reason I think for this is that they they distribute user generated content and they are like it is individual speakers speaking to other individual speakers and the role of the platform is to match not even a speaker to listener but speech to a listener. So it can like a speaker speaks and the speech can last forever in that like kind of, and then be matched across time. Like now with like the algorithm and the newsfeed, the speech hovers and like kind of like lingers and then they match it with like the listener that has like some discreet amount of attention that they can spend on it, right? But like that is like the way, like that is a very different thing than what I, the Washington Post and New York Times does. Sorry, I, I didn't mean I, to I, cut I, you off, Nate. Scott, I, I, I would just say also that the, that, just following up on what Kate was saying, but that there are certain um, privileges that being a platform gives you that is obviously Section 230 um, uh, immunity. And so I, it, it would seem like if you are immune, for, I mean, the, the New York Times and Washington Post are not don't enjoy Section 230 when they're in their print incarnation. Um, and so, like, I think it, it's perfectly um, proper for, for, for Congress to say, if you get this, this immunity, you have to show that this is appropriate. Um, right. Anyway. Well, but uh, look, all websites, right, that host user-generated content have 230 immunity for that content, right? And so- For even that reason, content, Pardon me? For that reason that Scott said. Yes, yeah, but that'll include New York Times in the comment section, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But but I agree with you, Scott, on the basic point there. I had, for those who are interested, we did a Cyber Policy Center seminar at Stanford, me with Eric Goldman, uh, from where he was taking the very strong First Amendment argument here that basically said all this stuff is uh, unconstitutional. And his view is that, you know, for these purposes, that it's almost like, you know, sitting in the newsroom, watching the content, the decisions over content. And I was like, look, if you believe that, it's not clear to me any tech regulation is constitutional, because if this, which is, I, I don't want to undersell it, but I would think this is lower hanging fruit than other kinds of CDA 230 reform or, you know, stuff to do with Instagram and kids or, you know, pick your pick your area. And then also like, like Kate's doing work on um, antitrust here too, you know, which which is, uh, you, you know, you could make a First Amendment argument about the antitrust uh, enforcement also in, in theory, right? Um, you know, you can absolutely make a, I mean, that this is like, yeah, sorry, but like, but yes, I mean, the, or, or the lack thereof of like an antitrust argument is like actually kind of where I come out, unfortunately, <laughs> but like, yeah. uh, uh, it, it was necessary to like a, like a math problem that you look at it and you know what the answer is, but like then like the like the math like you're not going to get any credit if you don't like show your work. And so like I feel like I just spent like six months of my life showing my work. But yes, uh, like, well, I, 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 well, anyway, but the the point is just that like if this transparency law is unconstitutional, that we can't force them to disclose certain things, then I think you know there's a real question for for other uh, tech regulation here. But, you know, um, the, the, we, Scott mentioned CDA 230. There is something in the final bill that I did not have in mind, which is removal of CDA 230 immunity in the event that they, uh, the platforms don't cooperate uh, with the, these kinds of public interest obligations. So 
Um, there is, it's, 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 people it's have a talked narrow, about that for a while. It's like a, I think it's a pretty good, like, well, it is. I'll tell you though, that's what I've gotten some blowback from some folks on that. Um, but probably because it kind of muddies the waters, you know, it's like now it becomes a CDA 230 bill, but, um, you know, I'm comfortable with it and, um, it can, it can be bargained away in the end if, if necessary. Um, but is it, yeah, go ahead. is it really fun to have written a bill and for it to be debated in Congress? Is it fun? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, the I think it's a good question. Was, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I was, it was good to testify, you know, a month or so ago, uh, and to see. And there were a lot of people actually showed up to that that hearing as well. Um, it's nerve wracking though, because I expected when I released this that I would get savaged by the privacy folks uh, in particular. But I think you know, I tried to cover my bases enough. Uh, early on and try to get them, if not on board, at least to know that this was coming, that um, I think they're being cautiously optimistic. I mean, look, as with every piece of legislation, you're, you're asking me if I'm the, the bill sitting on Capitol Hill or, or what, what role I'm playing. It's um, the chances of passage are low, right? Just because the chances of passage of anything with this Congress are low. My hope, though, is if they do turn to tech regulation, that this will be you know, uh, the, the first among equals there, because I think the Democrats and Republicans can actually agree on this, whereas on CDA 230 reform or antitrust or privacy or something like that, it's going to be much more difficult. Right. I, so, reason why, oh, the, yeah, go on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please finish. Well, no, I was just going to say my experience when I was testifying also is that, look, you know, the answer to all the criticisms is to say, well, let's find out. Right? And so when Ron Johnson kind of went off the handle in our hearing and started saying, well, you know, the, the liberal Silicon Valley executives are silencing conservative voices. My response is, well, let's find out, <laughs> right? The only way you're going to figure this out is if you have access to the platform data. And then when when the, the left is saying, look, these platforms are awash in incitement, hate speech, and disinformation, and we got to do X, Y, and Z about it, the answer is, okay, well, let's see. I mean, like I said, I, I, in the last year or so, I've become more skeptical on the role of the algorithms in promoting some of this content. I'm open to the possibility that that still is happening, that the, the algorithms are for the general. But um, I, I've, I've become more convinced that the problem is these concentrated groups of users who are opting in, in many cases, to these communities, whether it's through Facebook groups or otherwise, where they are um, then becoming radicalized. And, and, and look, that's still a Facebook problem, right? But it's a different problem than if it's just the algorithm. I, I 100% that matches 100% with my what my intuition has been for a while. And I really doubted my intuition for a while because people went so hard at the algorithm. And I was like, is there something that I'm missing about what this algorithm is? Like, they're mu like because this, but I don't, I don't know that there is, but like, anyways, Scott, you were going to ask a question, so go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to say that, like, you you made it sound so fun. I'm I, I'm thinking of writing my own bill. Sure. Um, uh, um, well, but everybody so that, says you're you're in the pocket of big philosophy, so I don't know whether you know. Uh... I I, yeah. I do I, I yeah I do want to have uh, immunity for all legal positivist um, speech. Um, I heard so favor is like really in the money. Yeah, well, uh, uh, please, uh, you, you write your own bill, um, um, <laughs> Kate. Um, um, do, you, do, we, do, we, do, we, do we think this has a chance of passing? What, what, what do the handicappers say? So the, the, where I, conversations are this week is trying to think what the, the, vehicle, the vehicle will be for this bill, right? So is it, would it be by itself or would it be... Um, attached to some, you know, some other tech bill, some other budget bill or, or the like. And I think um, it really, dep I, I think things are going to shake out as to whether, whether they're going to move on privacy, which I think is probably unlikely because that's, that's a hornet's nest. Uh, and whether they're going to move on um, the stuff with Instagram and kids, right? So that's another area mm. where you get the, um, bipartisan cooperation and so could this be thrown in with that now the problem with you know dealing with the the kid problem online is that 
it's hard to do that without kind of collateral consequences on anonymity generally on online because if you introduce a kind of age verification system to the internet right that is a pretty big deal and so not I that think you once, even could what'd you say not that you even could right right well you know you could figure out ways but the you know they're either not going to be effective or they're going to be draconian and so so once they have to deal with those problems we'll, we'll see uh you know how how things shake out um but but that's what i've heard right is that it's like we got to figure out some other way to put this and, and you know, part of what i my job right now and for that matter all of us who care about this is to try to make the case that transparency is actually a big deal that it's not i was did a i did a webinar with with zephyr teach out that francis haugen was on and some others wait and that was mine <laughs> the one that you yes the one you did for harvard right yeah Ariel? yeah yeah, yeah. Ariel. yeah yeah. Basically, you have to understand all of my professional achievements these days are due to K Clonic, and so we should just. I'm here. I'm here only because of K Clonic. I mean, yeah, right. it's really the opposite for both of you. But, uh, <laughs> but no, golly behind the scenes on all that. But, like, but, anyway. but I did think that, like, this, are you going to bring up the fact that, like, the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What were you going to say well, about this? Well, I was going to say, Zephyr uh, Teach Out went after me saying, look, we've got to be bold. I'm like, sure, let's be bold. Show me your bell. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. like, but this is this is the area that I, I know about and so wanted to move. But the point is, this is a big deal if it actually got enacted because, you know, if, if Facebook and Google know that they are being watched, right, know that outsiders are going to have access to their data, that will change their behavior, of right? There are implications for that. And, and you will. know, I think that... Uh, we need to think about it that way, that it's not just about providing kind of luxury good to academics. It's about putting, you know, kind of treating these companies as qualitatively different than other companies and that the potential dangers that they're wreaking on democracy just lead us to say that they're going to have to you know, lose their right to secrecy. So I really kind of I think that this is I think that this is exactly right and that transparency has that role. And I also think that one of the things that um, I, I think that like kind of I was be, I, I can't remember. I actually can't remember. I was with something with Laura Edelson recently and I basically said that you have to have this type of data that Facebook makes available to researchers like with Social Science One had done. And you have to have kind of the backstop of someone scraping no. and being allowed to scrape because that is actually the, the part about like you can't just have Facebook giving data to researchers and that being the only thing there have to be, there has to be like a double check like that is what like the, like the mismatch is where the account like transparency turns into accountability. Um, and that's like, I think, kind of something that people don't talk about as much because they're just always like, but that's one of the beautiful things about this bill, Nate, and I think is awesome. I wanted to quickly, where I have, we, there's a ton of questions, but I wanted to quickly mention, I was talking to Renee DeResta recently and we were kind of like chatting because um, Renee and I had known each other before either of us were involved in this space at all, um, like way, way before through like mutual friends and like that, like just New York world. And um, we were kind of chatting about how we have been reluctant to have normative conclusions on stuff for the last five to six years and this, how much the space has grown in just six years. And you were kind of saying this, Nate, and I was thinking about how you were kind of talking through the crowd tangle problem of how information moves. And I could feel myself even like I have heard this before, but there is a part of my brain in which there is like, it is still new information and I'm still trying to fully like hold it all in my head against all of the possible meanings and the ramifications of what that will mean aside like all of the other and like what do you think are like the chances that the reason people aren't writing good bills or bills that will pass or bills that aren't super politicized is really because people just genuinely have to go through a process when this type of new technology presents itself in which they understand it and they have to kind of like figure out, like have a norm setting. I've said this for a while. We say norms all the time in the show and everyone should drink, but there generally is like actually like 
all yeah <laughs> your club said it but like genuinely like like i mean i think we're finally getting there so i think that look we are now farther and, and cecilia kong had a piece in the in the new york times a few days ago about you know how it Congress was awesome. is not is complaining a lot but not passing anything but she notes, I think correctly, that we have come a long way from the day when Orrin Hatch asked Mark Zuckerberg, how do you make money, basically? And he says, Senator, we sell ads, right? It and so, was three years ago. It was April and, of 2018. Are, yeah. It was well, April think, of 2018. I was on the job market. That My Harvard Law Review article came out the same day that Mark Zuckerberg got asked about his, like, how do we make ads in Congress? Like, it was the same day. That is how far we've come in three years. It's, like, yeah. insane. <laughs> well, well, I think that, yeah, and you know, a lot of it is that the staffers have now learned a lot and, um, you know, and then there's been a lot of soul searching over that time about what the problem is, but, but we haven't passed anything, right? And it's not clear that, that we will. And, um, and so then why can't we? And so there's two sort of levels to answer that question. The first is it's the same reason we can't pass anything, right? There's just such division and paralysis in Washington. That, that there's just a very high bar to jump over if you want to regulate, uh, you know, industry in general, maybe Silicon Valley in particular. The second is the complexity of this, this issue and how it's, it's, it's changing so rapidly. And so one, I don't know if it's a criticism, but a question we've got on the bill is what would it do to the metaverse, right? And, and so will you be able to, because this really focuses on websites or mobile platforms and the like, and I think it does need to be amended so that it's clear that it would deal with virtual reality as well. Ryan Kalo asked you this question on Twitter. He was yeah. like, "What? What are you going to categorize an Oculus as?" I think. He yeah, said, and, and so that question. was something actually in my original bill where it wouldn't have been a problem. But the way they've done the language here, it might be, uh, require some amendment. I actually think it would still be covered by this bill, but let's just make it clear in the final version. Um, uh, and, you know, the other thing that we haven't even talked about that, that people need to understand is that the more and more that we move toward encrypted forms of communication as being the dominant ways that people are communicating online, the less able anybody is going to be to do any research on this, right? So that, well, we in the U.S., we don't use WhatsApp in the same, uh, to the same extent that, you know, Brazil and, and India and others do. Um, in those countries, right, it's really difficult to do this kind of uh, research. And in some respects, we need to we need to study Facebook before it's irrelevant. Um, because, may, yeah. may, may I say something? I'm wondering if that really is a problem because the the insofar as researchers want access to the data because they want access to the data because companies are making money off of this, um, they're using the data, they're, they're engaging in moderation of the data, um, of, of, of the content. Um, but these are not the kinds, this is not the kind of data that would get encrypted. That is, um, the, the, the encrypted are the, you know, the kind of direct oh. communication. Um, but the going dark thing seems less of a concern when the companies themselves need to use the data and therefore need it to be unencrypted. So I, I'm w wondering whether the encryption is really a problem here. Well, but if you want to understand the disinformation problem, whether with respect to elections or say COVID in Brazil right now, if you can't study what's happening on WhatsApp, you're gonna get an incomplete picture, right? Because that is yeah. a much more, and so no, that no, is, I, I, yeah, I, 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 no, I, I get that for, for, for WhatsApp, which are, which are not the same kind of platform that something like Facebook is, but Facebook itself or Twitter or any of those types of companies, they're going to have their content unencrypted or else they won't be able to use it to sell. Yes, that, that's true. But, but part of the question is how relevant will those, I mean, what, what does the sh audience share? for encrypted platforms on the one hand versus unencrypted ones. And I can tell you, you go outside the US and you, if you look at the amount of time that people are spending on WhatsApp as compared to Facebook or Instagram, it's it's considerable. And so so we need to figure out, right? I mean, look, we're, we're gonna study the, whatever- Are you saying that data, people are spending time? It. Sorry. What do you, are you saying that people are spending time on WhatsApp messaging each other or looking at like that, like basically like 
individual link you're you're basically making the point that individual sending individual links to your friends through these encrypted messaging services taken over posting it on Facebook or yes, Twitter. Yeah. I mean okay. this is really, again in the US we don't quite appreciate what's happening in these in these other countries but but you know WhatsApp is not a kind of simple text messaging app in these other countries right yeah. people run their lives on WhatsApp and it's the size of the groups and the political uh, parties have figured out very complicated and, and clever ways of using WhatsApp to propagate messages. So if you're trying to figure out where the, mm. sort of the roots of viral communication are in, in on, on much of the disinformation and hate speech, a lot of it is going to be um, on WhatsApp. Okay. okay. No, Thank it's you. a really good point. Um, yeah. I, I have like a ton of other questions, but Dr. Doom, the floor is yours. It's just, you're a disembodied voice. Go ahead. Hi, Ed. Um, you know, years ago when, when spam first came to the internet, people talked about imposing costs on the transmission of an, of an email, which would change the behavior of the people sending them out. For instance, requiring some form of postage or something like that, which could be um, applied and rescinded depending on if it was welcome. Um, Virality has some of the same issues there. It's not that it's unwanted, but it is probes and infectious throughout the uh, throughout this uh, social graph. And it's not separate from the problem that you talked about with the aggregation of, of special interest groups. It actually is the it's a vector for creating those black holes of, 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 of groups. So these are not really separate problems. So one, one of the issues is that there's this notion of, of free speech, but it doesn't mean that there's necessarily a, a, a free pass for virality. And the question is, what is the, what is the uh, simplest mechanism that requires the, the simplest uh, level of, of, uh, of, uh, of monitoring um, and that it is, and, and behave, it depends on the behavior of of uh, people, the behavioral economics of people. If I have a cost, if I know that my message is going to propagate beyond a certain level and I'm going to be charged for it, I'm going to think pretty carefully about sending something out into the into the into the uh, into this viral uh, uh, you know mess. I could I could, for instance, say, look, I'm going to send this out and it'll go two you know two levels beyond me and I don't get charged, or I have a budget of the number of, of propagations and after that I get I get charged and so the, would it be possible and it would be reasonable to have some sort of fee associated with both the propagation um, in breadth which is to say to the people around you and in depth in terms of its levels that would mitigate some of this automatically some of the some of the problems that you see with uh, viral propagation. And it's a question rather than a, a statement that it will. Yeah. So first, let me agree with you on your first point, which is that, yes, there is a marriage of algorithms with self-selection so that, for example, Facebook's recommendations of groups are a way that the algorithm then leads you to these self-reinforcing communities. And so, and, and that's something, if you look at the election integrity project and the virality project that we're running out of Stanford, uh, in the in the Stanford Internet Observatory, but that you know we definitely find that, and so uh, you're right. These are, and, and, but 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 getting that right, understanding how much of the problem, whichever problem we're talking about, is a result of self selection versus algorithmic pushing of people is a critical question. By the way, and going back to, to our original conversation on this, Kate, I do think it's possible that what's happening in the U.S. is different than what's happening around the world in terms of the responsibility of the algorithms. We can talk about why I think that's the case, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that the algorithms do more work in a lot of places where they don't have uh, more human monitoring around the world. So that's the first uh, point. The second yeah. about kind of adding friction to virality. There are a lot of proposals that are out there. Um, in fact, Senator Bennett's staff just sent me something about like limiting the ability to retweet more than once or something like this. And, you know, these would be major there's uh, already that in a lot of places. What is that? That you can't retweet more than once. Well, like on, up once. On Twitter? Yeah. 
What do you mean you can't retweet more than, I mean, you can. Like you can't, like I can't like retweet like a Scott tweet. If like something like I like, it's like I'm blocking. I used to not be this way. I could like retweet it and retweet it like later in the day. But like now it's just oh, like. Oh, the same were... one you mean, the same one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the same tweet. What, oh, sorry. What did you mean? No, this was trying to say that basically you, that that if you, you would not be able to retweet something that I retweet from Scott. Is, is, is oh the, is yes, the, it's oh. like the it's like the the yeah, leapfrog. It, I, I know it's yeah, only like, one hop, right? Yeah, yeah. right. And it's, it's like okay, you can do. I mean, and then there are proposals to you know add other. All of you are coming after me for taking down Hertz. I just feel like I'm getting subtweeted <laughs> this entire conversation. <laughs> like, you should, no. look, you should have this as a service, Kate. That you actually you know help people with the. I, I want you to go after Enterprise Rent a Car for me since they screwed me over a month ago. It's like you, this could be lucrative. Um, I have four four people in my inbox right now who also want me to help them with their birds <laughs> rental car. <laughs> I have a very public email address, and everyone finds it now. <laughs> so like, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> The, 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 you know, look, the, as, as tough as the environment has been for publications generally, if you now basically said to the New York Times and every other publication that now you have to pay money for, you know, to, to get audience, right, it would, it would be catastrophic for them. And you, you really do need, when we think about these things about like slowing down the internet or kind of generic time, place and manner rules that you would apply to the platforms, and content, think about how it would affect the public, the media first, right? Not because they're the most important folks, but um, when, you know, th that would have huge implications for their ability to actually work through the platform. Because one thing I understand is that the entire media ecosystem has adapted to the platform environment, right? Now, we, we, there's no way we're going to be able to take the genie out of that bottle, or toothpaste out of the tube, right? No, they completely, they manipulate it like they're like some type of like marginal democratic like country or something. Like, it's just, I, it's, <laughs> this is, they've adapted, you know, for better or worse, they've got to get the eyeballs and they're going to get the eyeballs on Facebook and Twitter and, and elsewhere. And that's just the way it is. And so now if you say, well, no, you're, we're going to make it more difficult for your stories to go viral, then we have a problem. And then, of course, then the issue is, well, can you distinguish between the New York Times and Breitbart? Can you distinguish between, you know, certain types of speakers? But then we're back to the content moderation problem in, you know, writ large. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is that uh, advertising is an area where I could see some of this friction being employed so that um, uh, the, you know, requiring human moderation of advertising, having kind of uh, cooling off periods to make sure you can't, like, particularly political ads, like do something uh, immediately. Uh, so that's something where I think you could have greater federal regulation on this. But I think just like slowing down the internet to deal with the virality problem, it's going to be a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that's like the other thing that I was going to say is that we were talking about social graphs. Oh, I like your t-shirt, MF. Uh, that I, that there was a- Coincidence. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the coincidence. Gonna, He's wearing it in lieu of fun shirt. It, it uh, really but... was. I just grabbed it. It was the next one. I, I have a system. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Jury. You have 10 of them. Um, but I was going to say three that. three rows. Uh... <laughs> and you have to take the first one from one of the three. <laughs> I want one of those shirts. All right. I uh, will send you one. Um, we can send you is... one. Yeah, for sure. There. I was just going to say really quickly. Um, you have mentioned this a few times about the social graph. And I think that actually what you see is the social graph either through WhatsApp becoming independently reinstated through individuals like sending things out versus relying on the algorithm to populate it for them. And then like, as you said, in like kind of the WhatsApp model, but the other way that the social graph is becoming irrelevant is through things like TikTok, in which it turns out that people really don't give a shit. If it's people like are entertaining them from like, you know, from their exact like, 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 like circumstances or like anything or anyone they know, um, they want to be able to send that stuff to their friends if they are a creator and like start there. But like generally there is like this idea of uh, it's a, it's a much more leecher friendly, much less while being a cedar friendly environment it's not like based on like kind of a, on a social graph and so i think that that's kind of an interesting mm -hmm. um caveat mf go ahead so 
I know this is sort of an obvious question and you did touch on it a little bit, but my question is basically that like, given our current political climate, how likely do you think that this bill is, could pass? And I know the answer is to some extent, not at all, because of course nothing can pass. But this is interesting because this is a topic that I think both sides of our sort of weird dystopian uh, bicameral kind of you know political system <laughs> kind of agree on to some extent and for different reasons. And I guess the follow up to that is sort of at the, at the same time is if you if it doesn't pass, which I guess we probably would agree is likely, what do you see as kind of a best alternative to this? Like what should we try to be doing next to kind of further this agenda? Or is there something that we can do, right? Like to kind of push this forward. And I ask this because I know that, you know, it's it's easy to say our Congress won't do anything because anything upon which there's disagreement, they'll get mired in kind of, you know, uh, re-election concerns. But this one is interesting in that regard because it isn't quite so obvious. And so I wanted to kind of get your take on those, those things. Well, my view is that if there's going to be tech regulation, that this is the kind of bill that is most likely to get passed, right? And so I think it has the highest chance of passage of anything like this. And so I want to, you know, I want to be optimistic. And there was a reason why it, I, I think Portman and Cruz are a good combination, right? That there's a, a centrism to that, let alone bipartisanship. And, you know, like I said, when I testified, whether it was Mitt Romney or Ron Johnson or, um, you know, folks on the right, uh, they're in favor of it. Um, the other thing I'll say is that one of the reasons I'm optimistic that over the medium term we will get a solution here is that if we don't do it, the Europeans will. <laughs> so Rebecca Trombel at GW has been leading a working group in Europe on data access. And I think that, you know, the Europeans have this at the top of the agenda. And so in the implementation of the Digital Services Act, we should expect to see some work on compulsory data sharing. And that should come out in around June. And so you know, the question is, is it going to follow a format like the one that we put out there? Or will it be something like um, uh, what the Europeans are putting out there? And I think that, uh, you know, either, as with GDPR, if, if Europe is the tail that wags the American dog here, that's fine with me, uh, as long as we get some good uh, research out of it. Yeah. Joel, it looks like you're making us pork chops for dinner. Uh, so what we have is we have tiny steaks, and then I have some onions and broccoli and peas, and they're going to go with some curry and some coconut milk. Oh my God! <laughs> like we like be done wandering in into Joel, Joel's live stream cooking show. Fabulous, you know, <laughs> impressive. Yeah. So I uh, thank you so much for coming to hang out with us today. Uh, it's super interesting. Uh, it's a delight to have you here. My question is, I am Joel Q. Public, right? I am not a lawyer and da 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 So if your bill works out, what does that mean for us, right? And if it doesn't work out, well, then what happens then? Just in kind of regular yeah. folks kind of terms. So my view on, on the, the, the role that data access and transparency in general will play is, is sort of at different levels. The first is that... Um, you know, it, it, and this is where it will affect you. With luck, what it will do is educate policymakers so that they can de develop better policy when they're trying to do internet regulation generally, right? So there's there's a lot of folk wisdom out there, which is wrong, that I think will be counteracted once we get good information out of the, uh, the platforms. And so just in terms of tech regulation. The second is I think it will affect the behavior, as I said before, of the platforms themselves. So if you're a Facebook user or a Twitter user or whatever, then I think that that with this research will come additional interventions by the platforms to deal with things like disinformation and hate speech. And so we'll have a better idea of, of what works. Third is, you know, the information that, and the studies that would be conducted uh, because of this, this law um, will give us a, a, a sort of window on the world, right? Because, you know, since most of human experience is now taking place on the internet, right, and, and most of the data relevant to that experience is locked up in these private companies, if we want to understand almost anything, for example, like what, you know, what are the best ways to try to get at COVID, not just the misinformation surrounding COVID, but COVID, where you can try to match up the data about what people are talking about on Facebook with what's happening in, in particular areas, right? Or if you want to understand 
um, you know, about rising extremist groups or vote suppression, right? What works to encourage voter turnout? All of these questions, right, which are not about the platforms themselves necessarily, but about, you know, social science, society, health, personal well-being even, right? All of those questions, uh, you can get partial answers from them if you have access to the, to the internet related data. Yeah, I think that just like, I think that one of the things that drives me the most crazy about this area to study is like how, as I've said before, how goldfish brain it is, like how we like have a 30 second memory, a three second memory for everything. And then we're like bat right back in the same place. We're like, wait, like they're giving special treatment to the prime minister of Norway. Like, <laughs> and it's just like holy shit, like, come on, like, let's just be, you know. Um, but like, I, I mean, really, like it, it does feel, I mean, that's like the thing that over time has been like kind of mind bending and like, I wouldn't get through it without people like you, Nate, and like all of the work that you support through the cyber policy, like center, like, I mean, honestly, like Daphne Keller is like my, like my, like, like my, my. I don't know what is the, like what is a stone that you touch to get power is there like something like that <laughs> like that is that's daphne for me i was just like i feel like anytime i'm with her like i just like get smarter and like have I, more I interesting agree. conversations she is, she is the uh the, the north star for many of us so yeah but, i mean so it just, it's great well one of the things that seems so interesting about the bill is that if it passes or to, to, to make the argument for its passage, each side gets to say that they own the other side, right? So like the conservatives say, we own the libs because now we're going to see how big tech is. It, I mean, it's a point you made at the beginning. And then the liberals will say, ah, now we're going to see the ways in which disinformation is, is circulating. It reminds me a lot of like, sentencing guidelines in the 1980s were, were and that was enacted because conservatives uh, have said, oh, we'll see that the liberal judges are too lenient. And the liberals are saying, we'll see that the judges are too racially discriminatory. And so if each side can say they own the other side, then, then that's democracy. Don't tell anyone, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> That's our secret. I really and hope they don't pass your bill, Nate, because we'll all be owned. Yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, Nate, I, I, I think that this is, as you said, it is the hardest to put details onto this. I have contemplated how I would write such a thing many a time. I have no idea. Your, um, I actually learned a ton reading the draft that you had before it got kind of all manhandled by the staff members that are probably like, okay, let's give them some credit, but also I didn't elect you staff members. So like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, like, I, I think that it's, 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 a, it's a, it's a, it's a thankless job, but I know you've worked really, really hard at it and you did it while redistricting an entire state, couple of states, I think, couple of states. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, that's that's my, yeah so you can see my, uh, my maps, yeah, that's my. I just want everyone to know. The next, yeah. When I wake up at six o'clock in the morning on the East Coast, I sometimes like send Nate a message on Signal, and he often responds at like within three minutes of me texting him because he's up writing some redistricting proposal to be ready for a six a.m. like email inbox of somebody on the east coast and it's just, like kind of incredible so like man no one told you that when you finally get tenure at stanford law school you don't have to work this hard like what's going on <laughs> well th those of us who work in the democracy area it's been a you can call it embarrassment of riches or embarrassment of i don't know um tragedies um, yeah uh, yeah tragedy and so you know, look, before the redistricting, I was working on as because I was on the show talking about the Healthy Elections Project, trying to help local election officials prepare for COVID. And then it was out of the frying pan of election administration into the fire of redistricting with, you know, doing the cyber stuff along the way. So, yeah, I mean, right now I'm done with Maryland. I'm done with Utah. I have uh, Puerto Rico left in my that I have to do. And I've got several local governments, but we'll see. That's before didn't the court. You, that's didn't before you do Pennsylvania? Well, I did Pennsylvania, the, the ones that I did, 
I mean, the ones I've just done in the last year. And then before that, I've done Pennsylvania, New York, you know, Connecticut, Georgia, Maryland. Uh, but but um, but we'll see. This is before the courts have gotten involved, right? So we'll see in the coming weeks whether uh, the courts are going to start uh, drawing maps uh, in different places. Wow. Yeah, that'll be wow. super interesting. Get this man a clone. We need like two of you. <laughs> like yeah, one I, for the I mean, you really... You re you really totally psyched me up, but like tomorrow I'm going to, the, in the morning, I'm going to write a bill for Congress. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to start fucking redistricting. Um, because <laughs> we, need a, we need a good make, acronym for like legal positivism for all of us or something, but you got to figure out how to make it spell. Yeah, come up with the acronym, Scott. Yeah. That's the first step. Right. I, I, I wonder if exclusive legal positivism for all doesn't kind of work because of the <laughs> exclusive and the for That's all. Tough. But but I will I will work on it. But thank you very much. You've you've been an inspiration, and I know we, have, we workshopped um, exclusive legal positivism and why it's <laughs> not for everyone before. So, like, so this is this is not news to Scott. But yes, Nate, thank you so much for coming on. This thank was you. a really fun way to spend an hour. Um, and we will be back twenty two hours and fifty five minutes from now. I think with Mike Pesca is going to be joining us tomorrow to hang out um, and talk about how the gist is going now that it is rebranded with a naked cat on apple podcasts um it's not a naked cat it is just a cat but like it doesn't have any fur which i guess is the same whatever anyway uh nate it was a pleasure as always we don't have fun anymore scott but in lieu of fun we can write our own bills we can write our own laws for for for, for congress we can redistrict and we can reply to Kate at three in the morning Pacific Standard <laughs> Time. Um, bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, Nate. guys.